Hey friends, I'm Greg Nettle, the host of the Church Planting Podcast. I have the privilege of serving as president of Stadia Church Planting, where we help you start thriving, multiplying, growing churches for the next generation. I am really excited about today's guest, Mindy Caliguire. She's a close personal friend. She serves on the board of Stadia, and she's a church planter. Mindy planted a church in Boston years ago, and out of that became passionate about the need for soul care for church planters and leaders in every space. Would you welcome Mindy Caliguire? So I'm here with my dear, dear friend, Mindy Caliguire, um, and Mindy has is, is, is been a friend for a long time, but she also serves on the Stadia board as well as uh, a mentor to me in the area of soul care and many other things. And so, Mindy, I'm just delighted, ab- absolutely delighted to have you on this episode of the Church Planning Podcast. Oh, Greg, uh, it was an easy yes. I'm delighted to be here with you. Love what, what Stady's doing, what all the people listening are doing. This is really important. Okay, so Mindy, um, soul care, I mean, it's kind of become a buzz a little bit now. Um, a lot of people talking about it. Um, what, what would you, what's the uptick in it? Why, oh. why has it become such kind of a household Oh word? my gosh. I, so, you know, I've been dealing with these themes for over 20 years. So I first got the URL of soulcare.com uh, in 1998. Like the internet was barely Very born. Smart. Smart moves. Smart I moves. know. Well, I, I just knew smart people and I trusted them and they told me you should go do that. And I said, OK. And uh, and so, yeah, I do have a, a longer term perspective on how this theme has been prioritized or not. And I would say for many right. years, I felt like this was, I mean, at best, something that people would think about if they had nothing better to do with their time, which for leaders never happened. And uh, a lot of my work was trying to help leaders get at a visceral level why this is so important to their life, but it was still hard, I'll say. Um, and to tell you like the, the difference in the uptick, uh, a couple data points. One is I had started the year 2020 with two speaking engagements booked, um, which was pretty normal when it's not my vocation to be out there doing speaking. Uh, I just take opportunities when they would come. And I calculated by the end of that year, I had been in front of a group, a podcast, a webinar, a speaking engagement, live, virtual, staff meetings, the whole thing, um, 45 times in those nine months. <laughs> 45 times. Which means you need more You need more soul care personally. Well, huh? The good thing is that this is this has been my way of life, Greg. This is when when you live this way, the good news is God can sustain us and we can avoid the ruts, which I knew all too well, of drivenness and anxiety and and just pushing and crushing your own soul. So I I did need it myself, uh, but this it wasn't like a new Herculean thing. It's like, no, I this is what I know to do is when life is, this crazy, is how you live. when life is crazy and life is always crazy, right? There's always a thing and learning how to rest your soul in God when things are crazy, um, has been one of the biggest gifts of, of my own soul's collapse and the many years since another data point, I'll tell you this because I couldn't wait to tell you the story. So there's a church, uh, relatively local to me here in Colorado who, um, the pastor started thinking, I want to start helping my people have a soul care plan. I've been making assumptions about their life with God and they've been making assumptions about me and I don't want to do that anymore. I want to, I want to, um, be intentional and I can't make them care for their soul, but I could make them have a soul care plan anyway. So these were the things he was thinking about. He literally Googled soul care. (laughs) (laughs) So look, finds the soul care website, realizes I'm up in Boulder, realizes we know people in common and starts like just sort of exploring a relationship that has resulted in two key dates and things. And I'll just tell you, this is the uptick because this is so dramatically different than anything I've ever encountered before. The week of Christmas, he and his executive team did a full day of silent retreat with me. Wow. He hadn't even, That's the wrong time to do it. We're too busy. Yep. 
He hadn't even written his Christmas message yet. And they were there and present, Greg. They were there and present. And the goal of our team, it was not just me, our team, it wasn't only silence. It was walking them through a series of reflection exercises and visioning and whatever about the year ahead to result in a soul care plan. That was step one of our engagement with them. Step two was to do a follow-on retreat for their full staff so that we can walk their full staff. This is a 4,000 some odd church, right? Yeah, They're yeah. not small. It's got a big staff, beautiful facility, unbelievable. And uh, we did a full like four hour staff retreat on January 4th. Wow. Second, probably first business day of the new year. Second day. Okay, so this is fascinating to me because my hunch would be that he probably preached the best Christmas message he ever preached, and their staff is getting off to the best year that they're going to ever have. Um, that's the you know counterintuitive yes. part, right? Yes. Of you for you to even say that there. tells me you know it now. You've experienced this. I you do. know yeah. that it's counterintuitive. And yet it puts the, like you think about what you're putting your weight on, your confidence on, when you put your confidence yep. on God, and even if we have lots of good human strengths, when we put our confidence on the Lord, and that is hard to rearrange our wiring, the flow of the Spirit's activity is amazing. Okay, so Mindy, we're coming out, God willing, we're coming out of the pandemic, moving maybe into endemic stage, yep. hopefully, you know. Um, what are you seeing in pastors that you're dealing with? What what are they, what's the common struggles? I, a lot of our listeners, I think a lot of times we're not even aware of that we're going through things until somebody else says, oh yeah, that's, that's what I'm sensing and feeling. Yeah, I was with a group uh, yesterday virtually uh, that are all up across Canada. And uh, naming uh, like three big ideas that I was naming at the beginning of our time together. And one is just naming the lack of margin. We just don't have much margin right now. And, uh, you know, I'm in Boulder, Colorado area. You, we were talking before this call about the, the wildfires and the devastation in the community. Greg, we use the term burned out all the time, right? We talk about burned out leaders, burned out this. I have, you know what it is now. I got to tell you, when you are looking at a former three, two-story home with fancy cars in the front, and you are looking at a pile of ashes, you can't even see a refrigerator. You can't see a bathtub. You can't see a toilet. There are no couches. This is ash. Nothing left. And harrowing and and yet i i'm staring at it going this is what burned out is There's uh, well and none of us want I, I as leaders none of us want our lives reduced to ashes no, right no no and by god's grace thankfully true in my own life true in seasons of yours that is never the end of the story even at times when we feel Agreed. like we're looking Agreed. at right. a pile of ashes because out of the ashes hope will arise and God does create beauty out of ashes and I'm seeing it in real time here, but I've just never had such a powerful visual image of when there is no more strength, there is no more resource, there is no more left. And so anyway, in, with these leaders yesterday, just highlighting um, the lack of margin, the, the pandemic has just, people are exhausted, especially anyone in a caregiving role. So pastors in particular, but medical professionals, teachers, past, uh, police, like everybody's been on high alert. Everybody's central nervous systems, even from a physiological standpoint, we've just been on high alert for years now. And then, so there's the whole lack of emotional, relational margin, spiritual margin for many. But if you add like a whole other category is all the division and strife that has marked our country anyway. And many of those in the church have struggled. I mean, I've talked to you as well, pastors who've said, I, I can't say anything right. And then if I try to not say anything, then I'm in trouble for not saying anything. It's even worse. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's just like, they, they mean well, they don't, they, you know, 
And and then they're also struggling with a. I, I thought we were about something bigger than this, people, and they're realizing that their congregations have been discipled by Fox News or CNN. Doesn't really matter which side they're on. They they are not. They are they are they are feeling the failure of the imagination of the reality of the kingdom as they watch their own people and and really are on the painful end of their people's criticism and and is anyway so there's like that whole category there's like no margin the deep disappointment and sadness and anger and vitriol that that we've just seen and then there, I would have to look up my notes. I don't remember, but there was a third whole category. But back to your question, I think it is like vital for all leaders to just kind of pause and take take a little inventory. Like, how am I doing? How how, how am I? How is my soul? Because okay, so let I, I gosh, there's so much to unpack here. So if, Mindy, I just know as a church leader, a church planter. Um, who's in the midst and, and are, you know, are, I'm so proud of all the, all of you church planters out there. And I'm watching you launch in the midst of what Mindy's just described and you're entrepreneurial and you're, you are, you have deep, deep faith. And, um, and yet, and, and so many, I'm going, I, I, how do they take inventory? I mean, you know, I'm, I'd like to be able to say, yeah, I know how to take inventory. I'll go in and sit in my chair and, um, <laughs> Light you, you, but right. But I'm going, if, I mean, if I'm like church planners or anything like me, I'm going, yeah, that sounds good. But how do I actually do yeah, that? Yeah. There's lots of good ways you can, if you're willing. And, um, if you, I would urge that at some point, January is such a good time to do that. We just did a semi silent retreat that had a whole worksheet people can download if they want that guide you through an inventorying process. But, um, minimally to just sit down in a non judgmental open pages of a journal and just start saying even prayerfully, God, what is going on inside my head right now? What? What is really going on in my heart? What are the emotions that, what What are some things I need to lament that I'm just sad about, that I'm angry about, that I'm frustrated about? What are things that coexist that are I'm grateful for? But like just to start naming the interior reality is a really important thing because many of us, we're just so good at functioning on the sort of on the outer, outer zone, the public stuff. We just make stuff happen and we get going and going. And to pause and reflect is one of the most important rituals, routines for your leadership, period, but particularly right now. Okay, now, Mindy, this doesn't have to be like, um, I, I, I know listening to you, okay, uh, you can take a four hour block, you can take a full day, you can take three days. But the reality is, a lot of times, this doesn't need to take four hours. This could be me setting aside one hour, right, with my journal yep. and just asking some, okay, on a scale of one to 10, yep. how am I, yep. you know, yeah. Yeah. doing one physically, other, spiritually, my marriage, yep. my kids? Yep. You know? One of the other um, sort of constructs for an evaluation or a self evaluation is to think through. Um, the different dimensions of flourishing that Barna, Glue, the Human Flourishing Project at Harvard, they've identified five different areas. And this soul care plan uh, walked those pastors and leaders through this. Um, and those five areas are deeply research based and shocker, they very much align with how we understand yeah, God to yeah. have created the world. But those five areas are one is your spiritual connection, right? Your spiritual groundedness. How is that going? Second is your relational connections. Like are your relationships as satisfying as you desire? And what are, what are those layers of support relationally for you? Third dimension is all of around health, uh, physical health, but that very naturally connects to the concepts of mental health, right? Mental health and physical health, both of those sort of live in your, in your body and uh, are separate from one another, but very related. So assessing how, how is your health? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting the right food? Are you getting movement? Are you, you know, struggling with depression or any other anxiety order disorders? Like, like let's start talking about it. So anyway, uh, spiritual, relational health, physical and mental health. 
But the other two that are really interesting coming out of the research, and guys, as church planners, this is vital for us to be aware of. One is um, vocational. How are you doing with your sense of vocation? Guys, that is such a big part of how we make meaning in our lives is our sense of purpose, our sense of calling. And many of us in ministry have a deep alignment of our vocational track and who, who God's made us to be. But it, that, is a, that is a driver of the experience of flourishing, of, of human, like shalom, you could say. And, and, and in light of what you've already shared with the division and disappointment, that's an area that could really be approaching burnout. Yes, yes, because I'm so called to this, and my hope for my people is not being met. So where is that, you know? Okay, so that's a great call out, Greg. The, the last one, and this is the one that for uh, church planters, I can speak from my own experience when we were church planning in Boston. The last one is financial. And guys, a lot of times in ministry, we don't talk about the weight of financial pressures yep. because it maybe doesn't sound very spiritual or it seems like we have a not faith or something. And... Uh, and the interesting thing in the flourishing project, the data, what it showed is not that um, we struggle. It wasn't. It's not measuring how much you have. It's a sense of are you are you well? Are you whole? Do you have enough? And uh, you know, everybody, there's questions where you know multimillionaires are wondering if they have enough. It, so the, the the question of enough is always a bit relative. Right. But getting at our sense of contentment. Or not, and, and not even just discontent. So I'll just say from my perspective, when we, we were church planting for 10 years in Boston, there was only one time in those 10 years, Greg, when we could see more than two months out in terms of knowing we could pay our mortgage. And so you're constantly feeling that stress constantly. and tension. Constantly. And boy, that is the world most church planters we live in. Oh, I in. know. I know. And, and <laughs> just to, uh, you know, sometimes that reality isn't going to change right away. But to name it, to go, man, I am exhausted of always not knowing if we can pay for our groceries. If we can, if I'm going to, as it happened to me, <laughs> you know, you go to the checkout line, you've got $100 worth of groceries in your thing. You go to pay and all of a sudden, not only did you not have money on that card, but you're like safety, whatever, whatever they call yeah. that overdraft yeah. had bottomed out and I didn't even know it. And it was so much shame, yeah. embarrassment. Like you're just trying to do God's work, right? But it just, oh. So anyway, those five areas gives you another sort of a, a, a construct to think about. Okay, so I think I think that's a great tool right now to just stop and pause a moment and mm -hmm. say, okay, if you're listening, write those down, spiritual, relational, health, vocational, and financial. And then that's your starting point in prayer, yeah. you know, get in a comfortable place and and just start asking the questions with God and saying, how am I doing? Maybe with a trusted friend, right, yes. Mindy? Maybe your spouse, maybe another friend and say, how do you perceive me as doing the, in this area yes. um, to get some insight from out, outside? Yeah, but, uh, vital to connect with someone else as possible. Like that's what we're doing with this church is we're following up with them with spiritual direction and coaching appointments to try to create that space for them to process and metabolize what they're learning. And then also the five areas give a good um, place to begin imagining with God, not like some self-guided, you know, self-improvement project how is god guiding but what is one or two things you might anchor into your 2022 rhythms to stimulate health in those areas probably pick one or two that seem most keenly okay okay let's talk about this because again I, I love the pragmatic mm -hmm. side of and of how you've helped me in my personal life with this so let's just uh pick out relational mm -hmm. and let's just go boy i feel really disconnected i feel like you know with with the pandemic and I, i've let some relations some deep friendships go i'm not getting enough you know life-giving relationships in my life so in 2022 i commit to x right. give give us some yeah. like real yeah. practical just a couple things jeff yeah. and i have been benefited over the last six months um where he just was like all right we're we're gonna it, like no matter how crazy schedules are, no matter how crazy, like we're going to do one 
connect a week, date night, whatever you want to call it. For the two of you, okay. Which most couples do that all the time, or at least it. Uh, I'm not so sure, but yeah. (laughs) We were the ones that were the delinquents. We just like, you know, kids and work and this and that. And I will say, he just texted me because we're displaced right now because of the fires. We're like morning, noon, and night helping out our neighborhood, peers, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and the joke is when I evacuated our house, Greg, like, you're like, okay, grab the passports, grab this. Like, you don't know if anything's going to be still standing. Right. And I grabbed four pair of boots. <laughs> it's like, <"What?" laughs> you just aren't thinking straight. Right. Like I got right, passports, right. I got some other stuff. And somehow I thought I needed four pair of boots and a bunch of underwear and nothing else. It was ridiculous. Um, and so he's over at the house right now, and I gave him a list of things he needed to pick up. And he texted me just before this call and said, date this week, Boots Girl. Ah, that's good. That's and good. And it's like, I don't know how we're going like to do it. a date. It doesn't matter. It's like he just – he it has been such a blessing to me personally that every week relentlessly, okay, what night is it this week? Which time is it this time? It's never the same. It's always different because our calendars are nutty that way, as probably most of you alls are. <clears throat> so that's one. Um, another is relationally um, recognizing that through our connection with people is one of the ways that God meets us. It is not just uh to hang out with your friends there is a very below the level of even awareness there is a larry crab used to call it connecting when we connect at a level below words something is being transmitted between us right now jim wilder and others are helping us understand how the brain processes and experiences relationships and that's what that's how we encounter joy that's that's how joy co- shows up in our lives is the look you know when you and I got on the call today and it's like our faces light up when we see each other that is what triggers joy in the brain when they do brain scans and stuff like that when people's joy center lights up it's when somebody they know sees them and their face lights up yeah. How, you got to Okay, Mindy, let me whose face is Okay, right so up. let me give a real practical thing yeah. that has worked for me that you know some of these planners and church leaders could could look at. So when I look at my calendar and, I, and I'm typically looking at it um you know not ov- we obviously have our year calendars and stuff, but if I'm looking 2 weeks out, mm-hmm. I I will literally each week look at my calendar and ask myself, do I have 5 5 life-giving relational connections so this week? on my calendar. Okay. Now this is critical because they have to be life-giving. So it it can't count as someone that I'm mentoring that I'm going to go walk in the park and disciple. Um it you know it can't count as someone that you know wants to meet with me because they want to talk about their marriage. These have to be people that that when I'm with them, I walk away going, wow, that was so good to just be with Mindy and be Greg Nettle in all of my foibles and everything. Here we are. And, and, to make, and I need to stay flourishing. I need five of those a week uh, on my calendar. And so just real practical listeners, you can, you know, kind of look for things like that. Hey, Mindy, um, gosh, I, I just I don't want to leave today without talking about something that you were part of with me and the Stadia board uh, mm-hmm. just uh, a year ago. I, I came into the Stadia December board meeting and we were all in person and, and you and West Stafford were there. And West Stafford's such a dear mentor, friend of mine, uh, you know, president of Compassion International for 25 years. But I'll never forget, I, I sat down at the end in our executive session and had my my goals for the year and um and i'll never forget steve porter uh our board chair saying you know greg um man you you know what and and this is steve's opinion so we'll take it with a grain of salt he said you're a great leader you know we um we would agree we we fully (laughs) well thank you but we we fully expect you to one either hit these goals or two uh, come back and tell us (laughs) You know, the pan- pandemic uh, hit and here's why we didn't hit these. Right. And and so we're, we're those are valid and, and we're concerned about those. But what we're really concerned about um, that we're not seeing on this sheet is your personal life goals. 
And and you and Wes so graciously met with me for the next several months, once a month, helping me do exactly what we're talking about here. We walked through all five of those areas and said, Greg, what's your plan for the coming year? And and Mindy, here's here's why I wanted to bring that up, because that for me, I can't tell you the benefit that was to me and my family at a personal level. But but here's what I told that story to our Stadia executive team and shared it with our full staff. And and I'll tell you the, the confidence that gave our entire staff in our board and in my leadership yep. was incredible. And so church planters, I guess what I would say to you, um, make sure that, you know, get your board to listen to this part of the podcast <laughs> so that they're, they're not just looking at, did you hit your numbers? Are you financially sustainable with the church? You know, all of those things, but let's talk about your personal goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Mindy, yeah. Speak into that a little bit because that came out of you and, well, um, you know, kind of driving. It gets back to that. Um, what did you, what was the word you used? Um, counterintuitive reality about the priority of the soul. Guys, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, your soul's well-being is driving everything that matters to you. Your leadership, your teaching, your mentoring, your relationships, your fundraising, all of those things, super important. They're all really valid and needful in our world. Every single one of those will rise and fall as it relates to how your soul is doing. Way behind the scenes, way just you and God. And there are very practical things you can do to, to, to reconnect, to stay grounded, to live out of a place of soul health. And when and as you do, all those other things you care about, first of all, they'll probably go in a better direction, but even if they don't, you have the, you have the ability, you have the resilience, you have the perspective of your life deeply grounded in God that's gonna allow you to navigate whatever the circumstances may bring. <clears throat> I think if we go back to that point in time, I think you, I would say you conceptually agreed with all that, but then as we started yeah. getting into like, well, what, <laughs> I, I don't want to over speak, Greg, but it was a little bit like, You're good. Keep going. you want You're me fine. to be silent and do nothing? Like, yeah. I'm authentic. Yeah, it was hilarious. You you want me to sit silently for how long every day? Yep. yep. <laughs> I know. It's so counterintuitive, Greg. It just, it, it took me so long to unlearn my mental habits from the past and to find new ways of opening to God in real time. Everybody who's listening has got great truths about God, great conviction. They're willing to work hard and leap small buildings or tall buildings in a single bound. But learning how to let your soul rest in God's presence and receive from God. I mean, that's, those are very uncomfortable things for most of us to learn, but we can. And I would believe that we must. Um, one interesting data point, Greg, is while I had those leaders, uh, we were up in the dream shed on the property at the time, um, on that day retreat. I also, because I was, uh, had been serving on the, as the chair of the board of our church, um, I was on a distribution list from the ECFA that went out to all board chairs and pastors that they had emails for, senior pastors and board chairs. And Greg, it was a series of questions about the soul care plans of your senior leaders and what might the ECFA be doing based on what they have heard. And this is, I knew, I had heard through some people that they were looking into how could we similarly, like they're the ones that credentialize that you you know how to handle money in a way that yeah. doesn't discredit the name of Jesus. They have for about two years now or longer behind the scenes, it was the first out and out public that I saw been saying, how do we also create systems of care and health around leaders? And how do we start talking about it, measuring it, insisting on it? Because we need to guard and protect the reputation of Jesus and the church. Because what's happening when leaders burn out, and then when you're burned out, you do all manner of really stupid things. We all do. It's not like, yes, it's, we not, do. It's, it's not rocket science. That's just what's going to happen. 
And I, I don't like it when people are like, oh, can you believe that leader did blah, blah, blah? And it's like, well, give me a freaking break. Of course they are. Look what people have been expecting. Look what our systems have created as an unsustainable. Un now, still, each person has culpability for their choices. Absolutely. There's no way around that. But I, I look at it from a systems standpoint, and I'm like, what is going to change the system? What is going to change the untenable, unworkable job descriptions that we have for leaders? And then we put them up on idols and, and then shock ourselves when they crash. And they have no, pub, no inner life because they're so busy leading the public life that we demand. Anyway, again, does not diminish public, um, what do you call it, uh, personal culpability and responsibility. No, agreed, yeah. But there are systemic issues that are far beyond it. So to see that coming out from ECFA, and I can show you, I mean, some of the questions are like, does your senior pastor have a soul care plan? Yes or no, or I don't know. No other options. Oh, we're thinking about it. Oh, we thought it would be a good idea. Yes, no, or I don't know. Does your senior leader have a plan for their staff? Yes, no, or I don't know. Is one of your board members meeting with your senior pastor on a regular basis to make sure that they are caring for their soul, basically? Wow. Yes, no. Unbelievable, Greg. And I'm like, the world, this is about the momentum changing. This is about yeah, yeah. enough people going, we're not, we're, we're, we've had it. We've had it with these unsustainable, never biblical ideals of leadership. That, that, that day, I hope we have a deep, enduring refusal. Those days are gone. Okay, and so uh, planters and leaders out there, you know, sometimes it's hard to go to your board and say, hey, I need you to care for me. We, you know, it feels wimpy and all that. But this is a podcast you could, or a vodcast, you could have them watch yep. it, you know, as a, a group together or listen to it and then come and discuss it. And it's an easy way to have someone from the outside actually speak into your leadership or management team if your board isn't uh, fully formed yet. Mindy, let's uh, wrap up with this. So somebody's out there right now and they're listening. They're going, oh, my gosh, I'm not doing very well in those five areas. Uh, definitely not flourishing. Um, how do they get I mean, they could go Google soul care, but. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been engaged with one of your spiritual directors. Um, you know, I've had the benefit of a personal relationship with you. I'm looking forward now because I'm going, you know what? I don't think I have a very good staff plan for soul care and, and talking with you about that. How can people engage with your organization? Yeah, uh, guys, we would love to serve you. Uh, head over to soulcare.com. We have a mailing list. That's how that is our first way of letting you know about stuff that's coming up. We have some digital online courses. We have a digital closed community. We're really not trying to enter the fray in, in Facebook and Instagram necessarily, other than to draw people towards this, uh, we call it the Soul Care Collective, uh, where we're doing online courses, groups. We're starting up one for pastor's wives in the next number of weeks and months, because, man, there's a whole group of people that often are not um, seen or cared for. So anyway, we're, we're, we're listening to people. We're doing a listening tour to try to understand what the needs are in organizations, large and small. And, uh, and those spiritual directors and coaches, we've got them all over the country. They all work virtually. We may have a new one in Canada as well. Um, we are, and they all get it. The thing that's unique to our team is that they all have had seats or still hold seats of significant ministry responsibility. And though they're not there to be a mentor per se at all, I just think it's important for you to know that they can hold space for you with God, yeah. with the good, the bad, and the ugly, whatever you're dealing with. And obviously it's all confidential. It's all, you know, it, we just want to create spaces for you to be you and see about helping your soul get to a healthier place. So soulcare.com, uh, don't, you know, don't let that go by. Mindy, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, you so much for joining Greg. us. Godspeed. <laughs>